tell I did, I did, I did, yeah, I did it right well. Well, the race Hello, welcome to another episode of Hussy Talk. We are here today with a legend in the sport of dog mushing. He holds the record for the most consec- for most consecutive Iditarod rod finishes with 37. He has completed the race 39 times with no scratches. He has 19 top 10 finishes, 12 top 5 t- finishes, and was and was an Iditarod champion four times. Please welcome to the show, Martin Boozer. So, hello, Martin. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks for the introduction. I should I should memorize some of those numbers myself. <laughs> Let's start at the end. 39 years. That's a long time. It's longer than most of the current racers are years old. What made you decide to retire after 39 years and not go for the number 40? Well, you know, it's uh, my my standard answer to that is I'd rather do 39 and be alive than do 40 and be dead, which is sort of a tongue in cheek, uh, letting people know how difficult it can be out there. And the last, the last, certainly the last two I did a rush has thrown some challenges at my body physically and sort of gave me the warning signs that maybe it's time to hang up the harnesses and um so two years ago my hands i call them went offline my hands for the first time stopped functioning about halfway through the race not because of frostbite or anything but just because of circulation issues um and then last year i just barely uh, made it through a storm that was raging on the coast and um a couple of those incidents were were challenging enough to say well i better i better take heed and let mother nature uh, give me a little warning sign but still let me pass through and so that's what happened the last couple of iditarods and i've been maintaining ever since i started racing if you if you're just doing it because of numbers you're probably not uh, doing it for the right motivation so we felt it was time to uh, coincide with the 50th running of the iditarod make it my last of your 39 finishes you have not scratched once what do you contribute to this well there's many things that go into not scratching and and one i think one important aspect of it is to have a plan um when i coach young people uh, we never call them anything but apprentices my apprentices uh always learned what i call a no scratch routine um we would we would organize and set up a system of where people would hopefully persevere Having analyzed the, the sport somewhat and certainly the, the good and the bad, the, you know, the people finishing and the people not finishing, I realized that uh, the letdown, if you do scratch, the letdown lasts about 50 weeks, meaning it lasts as long as you, you take to run the next Adirat. So you're, you tend to be depressed and down and disappointed in yourself. But every bit or maybe more important, the people that have helped you, fans, friends, sponsors, family, supporters, they have helped you get to the start and they're every bit as disappointed if you don't finish the race um, as yourself. So so we've come up with a, a scratch, a no scratch routine. Uh, you, go, you have to go to sleep. You have to talk to two, two or three trusted friends before you would um, quit and, and all that. So that helped me overcome Certainly throughout those 39 Iditarods, I had several races where things were very, very, very challenging and, and I could have easily hung up uh, and waved the, right, the white flag, so to speak. But um, because of my friends and family and, and my supporters, I decided to push on through. So I was able to finish every one of them that I started. Over the years of racing and working with sled dogs, do you know how many total dogs you have had through the years? Well, I don't know ex- the exact number, of course. I, I wrote a book. It's called Dog Man. And in it, at one point, I remember saying I, I was blessed with a thousand dogs that I know intimately well. And 
Uh, just imagine having a thousand kids, you know, your parents, your parents have the few of you and I don't know how many, but I know none of them have a thousand. So <laughs> I feel like I've, I've not only had my two own children, uh, my two boys, but I've also had my dog children and they probably number about a thousand over those, over those well over four decades now. The, and the scary, the scary thing is, I might remember them all if I if I think really hard. I might remember a, a whole bunch of them for sure. Were you ever able to breed the perfect dog? <laughs> well, I have a the standard answer to that is every dog is perfect, of course. Um, very much every student of uh, in your class is perfect in his or her own way. And my dogs, my dogs were special and, and perfect in their own way. Uh, now, when it comes to performance athletes, be that horses or chickens or rabbits or dogs, um, of course, selective breeding is a big part of shaping, shaping the makeup of, the, of, of those beings. Uh, race horses are a good example. The, the thoroughbred race horse industry is, is very, very... Um, thought out and organized and very much uh, pedigree oriented. In my four and a half decades of, of breeding dogs, I, pay, I paid close attention to the genetic makeup, uh, meaning where, where, what the parents, the grandparents, and, and on down the, down the pedigree, what those parents did. And for, I'll give you an example. One of my winning lead dogs had 28 other Iditarod champions uh, in in his uh, lineage so we call them thoroughbred dogs they they were highly highly cherished but uh, being being into genetics of course you could always wish for one maybe tiny little thing uh, being different so the answer is no there's no perfect dog but in a way they're all perfect we saw a video of you with your dogs. They looked very happy. How do you keep your dogs happy? Well, they're they're just extended extended members of the family. You know, it starts it starts really well. It starts before utero. It starts really before the puppies are ever born, um, and that's an important aspect. Is that our puppies? They don't just happen along. They don't just show up. The, the puppies are designed and planned. As you might know, dogs only come in season twice a year, uh, roughly every six months. And so sometimes we plan genetic makeup, the breeding of a couple of dogs, uh, this boy to this girl together. We might plan that sometimes years in advance. And then the timing has to be right. And by virtue of us having planned that sometimes so long in advance, when those puppies come out, we say, oh, finally you're here. It's kind of like, oh my, well, now we have you. So, so they don't just stumble along and, and, and come out of a, a mom. They just, they are literally wanted and designed and planned. And so then from day one on, we're excited having those puppies. And from day one on, we have a plan of what we do with those, with those little beings. Uh, we hand them to total strangers. If you were around, we would give you uh, one or two day old puppies to simply hold and carry around. Uh, we would teach you to rub their feet. Uh, we would teach you to do all the little things that we want our dogs to experience. Uh, be and, and all that, of course, is with purpose. Everything we do with our puppies, I could give you reasons why. And only if it makes sense to us uh, will it make sense to the dogs as well. So we socialize them really well and we're, we're excited to have them. We take them on walks on, on daily outings when they're little, uh, eventually the walks of course get farther and farther. And so we have a whole rearing process of our dogs before they ever become sled dogs. They're just simply going to be happy dogs and come when we call them and, and all that sort of stuff. Talk to us about what it, what it was like to do the race for 39 years while having a family. Well, I call it the uh, eighteen-hour days. Uh, good question, and and that's when you guys hear that you can you can be or do anything you want. Um, that's definitely true, 
But what might not be pointed out often enough is that it'll probably take you a whole lot of effort too. The hard work that goes into success is just a part of trying to achieve what your what your goals are. And and you know, I worked, I want to say for certainly 20, maybe 30 years, I worked 16 to 18 hour days. Now, if you do the if you do the math, that's uh, that still leaves you a little bit of time to sleep. But we would get up in the morning and we would hit the day running. We feed the dogs, take care of them, run, run, depending on the time of the year, 20 to 60 miles per day. Um, and while the kids were growing up, there was still time for the kids. There was still time for PTA meetings. There was still time for sports. There, there was not a single event when the kids were in high school, for instance, where I did not go to a track and field meet or a cross country meet. Uh, but the flip side, of course, is I just had to work at night with my dog. So since half of, and my, my approach always was half of the Adirati is at night anyway. So I might as well get myself and more importantly, get the dogs used to be working at night. So uh, as long as I could sleep three or four hours, Again, because on Iditarod, you're not going to sleep more than that anyway per day. Uh, that got me in good shape. And, and um, I feel like nobody was shortchanged when, uh, when I was in my ultra competitive years. But I also don't hold back from admitting that it was a, an awful lot of hard work. Talk to us about the support of your family. Well, fortunately... Kathy was a teacher. My my wife was a teacher. And now we, we joke that we've been married longer than I have run the Iditarod. So we're going on 40 years of marriage. And, we're, and I only have 39 Iditarod. So that's, uh, that's kind of some things last even longer than my Iditarod career. Um, early in the evolution of my competitiveness was such that I, I got infatuated with the sled dogs and eventually together between Kathy and I, we decided let's try to make a go of this with, with our kennel and becoming a racer and all that. However, we also had the fallback plan of her being a professional teacher that we could, if, if the dogs or my efforts or my sponsors don't pan out, we could make it with a teacher salary. So, so as a part of a long-term plan, Kathy being very, very supportive of my lifestyle, we also wanted to assure that the kids, the kids came first. You know, we love our dogs, but we love our kids even more. And so we had, again, we had a plan that we initiated before it ever needed to needed to happen. And, and we said, well, we, we take the teacher salary goes to the family effort. And my building efforts, I, I build our own homes and uh, I make most of my own equipment. Um, so we saved a tremendous amount of money of having all that provided for us by myself. Uh, but we had, a, again, we had a plan going into it. And and then, of course, the children came and they they're, they were just part of the, the working family. You know, kids grow into, if you, if you have horses at home, you probably sooner or later ride a horse. Or if your parents have cows, you sooner or later end up having to milk a few of those. Or uh, that's just part of the familiar lifestyle. And the same with our boys. They both grow, grow up in a dog mushing family. So when they were about your age, they started driving their own dog teams and then started running the junior I did right and, and all that. But uh, it, it was definitely always a family effort and, and a, a big support. And, and that helps, that helps tremendously. And again, nobody felt like they were jilted. Nobody felt like they were shortchanged because I was always going out with my dogs. I was always going out with my dogs, but I still was finding enough time to, to find a good balance between family, family and professional life. You've had a mentorship program over the years. How many Iditarod mushers have you mentored through the years? Yeah, I uh, sometimes we lose track, and mentoring is a good is a good uh, term. I, I mentioned that we didn't call them anything but but apprentices. Mm, I know of about twenty five people that have gone to mostly a two year program. Some of them have stayed much longer than that and uh, have become 
um, really like additional family members that were very, very close to, to this day. And some of them are still racing or are racing Iditarod competitively to this day now. Uh, Aaron Peck and Matt Failer come to mind, people that have gone through the initial apprenticeship here at Happy Trails. I remember Matt Failer is a good example. He, um, after college, he says, oh, I just, I just want to learn a little bit about dogs and maybe run the Iditarod and then go back to Ohio. Well, I think he's done 10 Iditarods now with his own dogs and he's got his own kennel and his own operation. And uh, so some of my apprentices, they have um, never run dogs again after Iditarod, which is which is perfectly fine by me. A good friend of mine, Harry, Harry Harrisberger, he um, he now lives in Missouri and has his own family and has his own business and has his own daughter and doesn't run dogs at all, which is perfectly fine. Not everybody has to maintain that sport or follow in my footsteps. But um, uh, I think what I did right in my apprenticeships uh, is I always shared not only the joy of working and, and living with the sled dogs, the other part is every bit as important, how to maintain them and care for them and pay for, it, pay, pay for the overhead that's uh, quite substantial. So... I think my my apprentice has always got the full package. They got the the truth about how much work it is, and uh, I always led by example. And there was nothing I asked of my friends or apprentices to do what I was not willing to do myself, and that resulted in every one of them going to the finish line. Now, Elliot Anderson, he he did about two thousand miles to get to the finish line. The poor guy. In a really, really difficult Iditarod in 2014, got into a severe storm and, and was stymied, I want to say 150, 200 miles from the finish line. And he couldn't finish that particular race, but then he came back and finished the race after after all the a couple of years later. So all my guys went went from start to the finish, and that makes me really proud. You've been part of 39 of the 50 Iditarods. How has the Iditarod changed over those 39 years? <laughs> Sometimes we reminisce over that. And I have a couple of... Uh, uh, base, the basic answer is everything has changed. In those five decades that the Iditarod is a sporting event, it started with your quintessential trap line dog, dogs that had been used as utilitarian dogs for for really millennia uh, national geographic as a matter of fact uh, found some uh, found some evidence and carbon dated evidence uh, in russia on the siberian peninsulas that sled dogs have been bred for that purpose deliberate sled dog breeding has been going on for 9000 years so 9000 years ago people didn't want a racing dog they wanted an efficient furry almost self self sustaining dog that traveled with people the the, the residents of course were semi-nomadic that meant they traveled with their dogs from place to place fast forward to 1973 when the first Iditarod happened people were still traveling with dogs they were trapping and hunting and fishing and and living with their sled dogs and still people didn't really need the speed that we have nowadays. So, so the 50 years of Iditarod has formed a dog that is not only as tough as the old timers dogs, but is much, much faster. So anytime you add the, the, the word race, R-A-C-E, means you want to go as fast as possible. So I think what I brought to the sport was the, the speed of the dogs and somewhat to, uh, some, to some degree the efficiency in which we, we run those dogs. I, I dispelled the misconception that a slow, steady dog would be ideal for the Iditarod. I, I believe that a fast, fast, furious, happy, long-legged, outgoing dog would be the panacea to win the Iditarod. If you have that kind of animal, you have to rest them a little longer. So the, the equation of running the Iditarod was totally changed to where we would run almost 10 miles an hour for about half of the time. And if you do the math, if you go 10 miles an hour for 100 hours, 
that gets a thousand miles. Well, you can't run a hundred hours. So you balance it out with a hundred hours of rest. That's 200 hours total elapsed time. And that gets you to the finish line in under nine days. And that's what's happening nowadays. The, the eight and a half to nine day Iditarod is the, is probably what I call the evolutionary maximum of the sled dogs of, of without a paradigm shift, without some new genetic influence or new diets or whatnot. Uh, I think our dogs can run to Nome uh, in about eight and a half to nine days, depending on the trail condition. What does it feel like to retire after dedicating 39 years, over half of your life to the Iditarod? Well, when I when we talk retirement, I'm, I, I'm first to point out that I'm just retired from Iditarod. I, I'm not retired from the dogs. I'm not retired from my lifestyle. I enjoy very much living with our sled dogs and working with them. I still get up every morning and I feed 50 or 60 dogs in the morning. Um, my helpers feed in the evening. I still run dogs. I share my dogs with literally thousands of people. We have hundreds and hundreds of visitors coming uh, for rides in the wintertime. So the Alaska Mushing School is an extended business of, of, our, of our kennel that a friend of mine runs and he books people to just come out. So you girls could go online and make a reservation and come for a, for a little outing with the sled dogs. Um, that's the winter program. In the summertime, we have a, a summer program as well. So I, I share the kennel with a program where, where mostly cruise ship passengers on their days on land in, in Alaska come and see the dogs. And we entertain them with a little video and with stories and equipment and share, share our sled dogs. And they get to pet them and play with them and all that. Uh, besides that, I'm working on three, four, five, or six different buildings all the time. I'm presently working on a on an off grid system uh, down by a little lake where I put on solar panels and a generator and and all that to a little house, and that's kind of fun. So the point is, I'm still plenty busy. I'm just retired from racing the Adirondack, and my body says thank you very much for that. You are one of the most successful Adirondack mushers ever. What are you most proud of over the years? Well, I'm pr most proud of my dogs and, and the fact that all my all my race efforts came, the, or I should qualify that, that 37 of my 39 race efforts came with dogs that I raised and bred uh, myself. They were basically, just imagine if you girls go out and you win a world championship soccer game with all your brothers and sisters or your aunts and uncles how cool would that be you know and that's kind of how I felt about my sled dogs is they like we were talking earlier their extended family and I felt like I take them out on the trail and winning the Adirat with my with my furry kids uh, that's really that's really the most exciting part to me if you were only able to share one story about your 39 years of doing the Iditarod, what would that story be? <laughs> well, probably my my 2002 Iditarod Championship. And you guys uh, are too young to remember or you were not around at 9-11, um, I think, right? Well maybe anyway 9-11 was a, a very big part of my my family's uh approach because i was on paper i was swiss i was born as you might know was born and raised in switzerland and after 9-11 happened in new york i said i'm going to become an american citizen and that was a big step for us and that started that creation of energy that Sometimes you see something in civilian life or in, in sporting sporting life, you see energy being created that you cannot, you just simply cannot make up. You cannot fake it. You cannot conjure it up. Unfortunately, you can't bottle and keep it either. It's just, you know, somebody might win the Super Bowl because of the, something important happened or somebody wins an important event or your teacher might finish a 100-mile race or however crazy stuff people do. And that's sort of my 2002 I did around. I got into that race and I was a little apprehensive. Uh, I didn't have a standout lead dog. 
but end up end up figuring out that they were all standout dogs. Uh, I started my swearing in ceremony in Anchorage where I carried my first American flag to the finish line in Nome. And then I got sworn in as a new citizen in, uh, in Nome under the world arch, the finish line. And then we finished up the tri trifecta. We ended up calling it by celebrating, truly making a victory lap with my two boys. They were 12 and 14 at the time. And Kathy, my wife and I, we took four snowmobiles and we retraced every step of the way from Nome back home to Big Lake by snow machine and visited all the checkpoints and the people along the way. And that was, that could be a book all in itself uh, by itself. And that was a pretty, pretty special way to celebrate Iditarod. What do you think you'll miss most about the Iditarod? Well, I don't know if I miss anything about, I guess, you know, the, no, I, I don't know if I miss anything. <laughs> I'm going to be celebrating the fact that I'm not bone tired in March and that I'm not in the in the blizzards anymore and that I can, if I choose to sleep, I can sleep. And uh, I'm I'm pretty pretty at peace about not running the Aditarod. So I, I, I don't think I miss much of it because, like I said, because I still have the dogs and I still live the lifestyle. The only, the only thing I'm cutting out is the, the hardship of, of running the race itself. And um, so other people can do that for me. Our final question is the dinner party. You are able to invite five Iditarod icons to dinner, living or dead. Who would you invite to your dinner party? <laughs> That's a cool question. Um, George Atla, an old time sprint, sprint, or I call him speed mushers. He also ran the Iditarod way early in the history of, of Iditarod, was one of my mentors. I learned a lot from him. So um, I would invite, I, I would invite George Atla for sure. Um, my good buddy Rick Swenson is the, is a five time Iditarod champion. He's sort of fallen off the, off the radar lately. Um, but he's still around, so he could he could be invited. I would I would probably for kicks and giggles just because Susan Butcher, of course, as you know, was a was a female icon of the Adirada. I wouldn't invite her. So just to have her and just to have her and Rick reminisce some of the some of the old time stories. Um, I probably would invite my friend Matt Failer, a young young up and coming racer, to to balance out the. The old and the young, the new and the and the and the future. Uh, so we're at we're at four of those Iditarod participants, and um, I don't know who I would. Maybe my friend Ken Chase, uh, uh, also an old timer who's still around, who uh, who ran. I want to say he ran nine or ten Iditarods in the early in the early years. He's a he's the quintessential. I call him a bicultural gentleman. He's an Athabascan Indian, but he can live in the in the white world, in the Western world, every bit as as well as living off the land and living living in the bush. So he would be a he would probably be number five to be uh, on the list of five Iditarod icons to be invited. Thank you so much for taking time the time to talk with us today. Thank you, ladies. Have a great afternoon. Okay, whenever you're ready. Special thanks to our guest, Martin Boozer, for being on our show this week. If you enjoyed this episode, please stop by iTunes and leave us a review. It helps with our ratings. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or people you would like to hear on the show, email us at huskytalk1 at gmail.com. If we hear from you or you leave a review, we will read it on the show. We would also like to give credit to Hobo Jim for our intro song, the I Did A Rod Trail song, and our outro song, Reddington's Run. Here's to Joan, it's off we go In the land of the midnight sun mm, They call this race the Iditarod Trail To me it's Reddington's Run In my heart it's Reddington's Run